you this morning. We've been talking about change, and we're going to continue talking about change, talking about making change in our lives. How many of you know that the Bible says as Christians that we should always be being continually shaped into His image? Amen. Um, Each of us were born with different personalities, We were born with different backgrounds, different ways of thinking, but we all have, as believers, we all have this one thing in common that we are supposed to be like Him. Now, we live in a culture that loves to make a lot or loves to make much of the individual. You know, everybody will put a big tattoo on their neck and earrings here and piercings here, and a lot of it is to make themselves an individual, make themselves to stand out. Or everybody wants to find something unique about themselves. Well, I do this and nobody can do it like me. Or I'm good at this and nobody's as good as me as it. Or I'm smart in this area and nobody's as smart as me. We all want to find this this thing that makes us stand out or makes us special or makes us an individual. But you know, my goal is not to be my best self. (laughs) My goal is to be who I can be in Christ. I'm not trying to separate myself as an individual and go, hey, look at me and how, how different I am than everybody else. My goal is to say, no, look at me and how much I am like Christ. <laughs> That's the goal. Now, I'm not there. I don't know that you can look up here this morning and and see Jesus. But, you know, that's our point. Is That's our focus is to be striving to be shaped into his image. Amen. And to be like him. And if we're going to do that, There's one thing that has to happen. Change. You have to change. You have to purpose in your mind and in your heart that you will not be the same person at the end of this year as you were at the beginning. And it takes effort on your part. It takes the power of the Holy Spirit. And it takes you getting intentional about it, focusing on it, and choosing to change this year, to not be different. I've been saying this for weeks, and I I firmly believe this, that at the end of this year, there's going to be a group of us that are going to look drastically different than we did at the beginning of the year. And there's another group of us that's going to look exactly the same (laughs) as we did at the beginning. Uh, And it's just because of what I'm talking about right here. There's some people that will not change. They've been the same way for five years, 10 years, 15 years, and they're just not changing. And they're not changing mainly because they don't desire change. But I talked about one week that even if you don't desire change, I believe that God can create the desire for change in you. I believe at the very least your heart should be in the place that you can go to God and say, Look, I wish that I was spiritual enough to even desire to change, but I don't. But can you, can you at least create the desire in me? Can you at least stir my heart to where I at least want to be different? How many know God would rather an honest prayer like that than somebody who thinks they're spiritual and doesn't need any change? You know, I'm, 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 I'm very honest with God in my prayers. If I go into prayer that morning and I don't feel like praying and my flesh is tired and wants to go back to bed, I usually tell God that. I don't try to fake it. I say, God, I'll be honest with you, I'm tired this morning and I really would rather be sleeping. So I need you to empower me and I need you to give me assistance in prayer this morning. How many know he responds to that? God will respond to the prayer of an earnest heart rather than a fake prayer from somebody who's super spiritual and they're trying to say all the right words, but there's no power in it because their heart's not genuine. He, he said that. He gave us that example with the, with the Pharisee in the, the center. And the, the Pharisee went out and he had this big eloquent prayer, thank God that I'm not like that sinner over there, that I'm spiritual and I'm righteous and I'm obeying the letter of the law of the T. And the sinner was over there beating his chest saying, I'm worthless. <laughs> I'm a dirty dog. I don't deserve your love. I don't deserve your mercy. And Jesus said, whose prayer do you think I accept? Actually, I believe the other kind of prayer of the Pharisee, I believe it actually is a stench in his nostril. I don't believe it pleases him at all. I believe it's actually more of an offense to him than it is a blessing. But the person that will go to him from an earnest heart and pray, boy, he will receive that. He'll listen to that all day. He loves to hear those kind of prayers. He loves to respond to those kind of prayers. 
Look, look at, uh, you know, blind Bartimaeus. Of course, we call him blind Bartimaeus. I'm, I'm often thought about that. Why do we call him blind Bartimaeus? We define him by his past sickness, but the man got healed. We ought to call him seeing Bartimaeus because he got his sight. But, you know, Bartimaeus, what did he do? Did he have some big eloquent prayer? No, out of his heart and out of desperation, he said, Son of David! Have mercy on me. And he yelled it. And people were telling him to shut up. You, you, you're distracting. You're disturbing. Be quiet. You just, you're, you're disturbing everything. You're distracting everybody. Be quiet. And Jesus said, do not tell him to be quiet. Because that is the kind of prayer that I respond to. All of y'all that got to act dignified and all super spiritual and like you got everything in order. He didn't respond to that. He responded to the one person that was calling on them out of a pure heart and didn't have everything right, didn't have everything perfect. I'm going to tell you, the longer I walk with the Lord, the more I purposely try to get away from Christianese in my prayer. Because I don't want to just come up, dear God, Lord of heaven and of earth, you know, I don't believe that we have to address him that way. I believe that the Bible says we're sons and daughters of the king, and that we can address him as a son, we can address him as a daughter. Because you've got to understand that it's not your great prayer that made access into his presence anyway. It's not your righteousness or your super spirituality that made you worthy to be in his presence in the first place. What made you worthy to be in his presence was the blood of Jesus Christ shed on your behalf. In the book of Hebrews, it says that we can come through that blood boldly into his presence. We can obtain grace. How many of you need grace? We can obtain mercy. How many of you need mercy? It says we can do it through the blood of Jesus. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11 today. I want to keep talking to you about change, and I, and I hope that as you're sitting in here that your heart is stirred for change, that, that something just rises up in you, and you begin to desire and get a passion for change in your life, to be different than you are today. Some of you might be sitting there thinking, well, I like who I am today. I think I'm all, I'm, think I'm all right. Well, I tell you what, I believe that we all ought to be changing until the day we die. I don't think you should ever stop changing. Always getting better because until you've arrived at perfection, you still, got, you still have changing to do. And as far as I know, other than Jesus, no human has ever arrived. And so I'm not stopping. I'm not stopping until I die. I believe I can always get better and I can always change. I can always increase more. And it's not really about you. It's about others because the more that you change, the more that you become the person that God is calling you to be, the more lives you are going to affect with your life the more people you're going to affect with your voice, the more people you're going to affect with your prayer, the more people you're going to affect with your witness, being salt and light in this earth. But if you're just a nominal Christian and you're satisfied with the status quo, you're just going to only affect a handful of people. And when you stand before God, you're going to wish that you had done things different. Because for the first time, you're going to see what this life was really all about and what you could have done and the potential that was really on your life and how God really could have used you. You're going to see it for the first time. And I believe even of those of us that have pursued God and we've given God everything and we fought and fought and fought to be, uh, you know, everything he's called us to be. I believe even those are going to stand before God and say, oh my goodness, I could have done so much more. I, I could have done so much more. Now, this is not meant to be something to condemn you and, oh, I'm not doing enough. You know, we're all at different places. It's not that. And pe I'm amazed how people respond differently to this message. You definitely do have a group of people that when they hear about change, they start feeling condemned. Oh, I'm not good enough. I'll never be good enough. You know, you start challenging people to change, and some people's reaction is they want to lay down and cry about it when they hear it. Because, oh, woe is me. I just, oh, I can't be that person. They want, you know, one person wants to cry. Another person wants to fight. They hear it and they go, yes, I want that. I'm going to fight for that. I'm going to push for that. I want to be that. Whatever person you are, I don't think it does much good to lay down and cry about it. But let something rise up in your spirit that says, yes, I want that. And I want to be different. I want to be better than I am today. And I'm going to push for it. I'm going to fight for it. Amen. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 11. I read this scripture last week. It says Paul was telling the Hebrew. Well, I say Paul. I believe it's the author. Paul's the author of Hebrews. He says about this we have much to say. And it is hard to explain. 
Since you have become dull of hearing, for though by this time you ought to have been teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. Now this statement has captured my attention because he says, for though by this time you ought to be something, you ought to be teachers. So he's, he's, he's looking at them and he's saying, okay, based on how long you've been in the faith, based on how long I have been discipling you, ministering to you, you ought to be at a certain place and you're not there. How many of you believe that's the case today in the body of Christ with many people? I mean, if Paul was here and he'd known us since we had first got into the faith, he could look at many of us. He could say, by this time, you ought to be here, but you're not there. Or maybe some of us, he'd look at and say, by this time, you ought to be at this place, and that's exactly where you are. You're coming along well. But everybody is not where they ought to be. And what I want to show you is that it hinders you, because what Paul goes on to say, he says, I actually have a revelation that I need to give to you about Melchizedek. I need to give this to you because it's going to help you. It's going to cause you to grow. He said, but you know what? I cannot give it to you because you're not where you ought to be. You're not at the place where you can hear it and receive it. So they missed out on this revelation that they were going to hear, but they didn't get to hear because they weren't where they ought to be. And as a consequence, you and I miss out on it because it's not written down in the book of Hebrews. And I believe it would have been because he was going to keep sharing that revelation, but they missed it because they weren't where they were supposed to be, and we missed it because they weren't where they were supposed to be. Well, what is the point? The point is, is that when you're not where you're supposed to be, it affects you, but it also affects others. It also affects other people, even generations down the road. Amen. I can tell you one thing. If my parents had not come out of the the lifestyle that they were born into and they were not where they ought to have been at a certain place I would not be standing here and this church would not be here you know one day me and my brother were driving down the road now I love all my family so if anybody in my family's here or anybody listening on the internet (laughs) well I remember one day me and my brother were driving down the road and we were discussing some of our blessed family members cousins distant you know relations and we were looking at that and and looking at their life and their situation and all sorts of just dysfunction and horrible things talking about it and I remember thinking to myself and I, I think I even said it to him I said you know but if it weren't for God we would be exactly in the same situation we would be no different than that person except for the fact that our parents decided to change and set a new standard for the McElwee family And now, what happened is that cycle, that generation was broken, and now we started a new generation and a new cycle. And now, I'm preaching the Word of God, and we've started this church, and now I have two young kids that are being raised in that. What are they going to do? What are their kids going to do? It just goes on and on. But would any of that have happened if they had not been where they ought to have been? What if, they'd consider, what if they'd continued in the same cycle of alcoholism, the same cycle of perversion, the same cycle of those things? Well, I doubt very seriously that my life would have been affected in the way that it has been. It would have been affected negatively. So your choices to be or not to be have consequences for you and for your children, for your family, for generations to come. And that's why I can't stand when I hear somebody say, well, I'm doing this and But you know, it doesn't affect anybody else. That is completely not true. It does not matter what you are participating in, what sin you are participating in, what level of apathy you are participating. It does not affect only you. That is a lie from the devil. And number one, it also assumes this. It also assumes that you are in charge of your own body and that you get to do with it what you want. But the problem with that is you didn't create your body. You didn't create your soul. You didn't create yourself. God did, and therefore you're accountable to the creator. People don't understand that. Well, this is my life, and I get to do what I want. No, you don't. I mean, you have the choice to do that. Yes, you do. But you, 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 must, you make the mistake that you made yourself. You didn't. Someone created you, and therefore they have a purpose in what they created you for. And one day, all of us are going to give an answer to the creator who made your life, made your destiny, made your purpose. 
and we're going to give an answer for what we did with our life. You do not get to go, well, it was my life, God. I got to do what I want with it. No, it was my life, and I gave it to you. And you were to be a steward over it and to live in a way that was going to honor God and bless others. Amen. Let's continue reading here. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 24, verse 3. Matthew chapter 24, verse 3. I just don't think we're going to get through all of this today. We'll just get as far as we can. Matthew 24, 3. It says, As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, and they said, Tell us when all these things will be, and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age. So Jesus had been given some uh, prophecy and some things about the future that was to come. So his, his disciples asked him privately, you know, tell us, what, tell us more, basically, about the end times. What, what's going to happen here? And he says, tell us what will be the sign of your coming and of the close of the age or the end of the age. And Jesus answered, see that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. You will hear of wars, rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famine, earthquakes in various places. All of these things are but the beginning of the birth pains. Now, all of the things that he just mentioned, have we seen that? I mean, every one of them. We've seen every one of them. We've seen the famine, the earthquakes, wars, rumors of wars, nations rising against nation. We've seen it all. But he says, okay, but that's only the beginning of the birth pains. It's not the end yet. Let's see what he says will classify the end. Verse 9. He says, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and they will put you to death. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Now, in this respect, I do believe we're seeing a lot of this. I do believe that we are seeing, you know, because... The Christian body is not just in America, but around the world. There is great persecution on the body of Christ. And if any of you have followed the news, there's a, a pastor right now in Iran that's facing the death penalty. How many of you have seen that? They've asked him to recant his faith, and he's not doing it. And so they've, they've sentenced him to death, basically, even though they haven't carried it out yet. So Christians around the world are still dying for their faith. Verse 10, he says, and then many will fall away. And they will betray one another, and they will hate one another, and many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. So then he talks about this part, and this is really the part that I want to focus on this morning. He talks about the fact that because of all the lawlessness that's abounding, because of all the deception that's abounding, that the love of many will grow cold. Well, he's obviously talking about Christians because sinners' love does, towards the Lord do not grow cold unless it's been ignited at one point. So he's talking about a heart that's warm towards God, a heart that's on fire towards God. And he says, but because of everything that's going on, that they will fall away. He doesn't just say it once. He actually says it three times. He says, many will fall away. And betray one another, hate one another. Verse 11, many false prophets will arise and lead many astray, says it the second time. Then verse 12, and because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. So he says it three times, emphasizing to us that in the last days, many hearts will grow cold, and many will fall away. Now, I'm not the smartest person on the planet, but I do know the difference between many and few. And he does not say a few will fall away. He says many will fall away. Many will fall away. Well, that should be disconcerting to us because what that means is that if we're here when this begins to take place, and we can already see that we're, we're moving that way, if we're here when this takes place, is there the chance that people in this room whose hearts were once warm towards God could fall away? Look, I look, I, I look around the church all the time and see people that fall away, and there is not any lawlessness abounding like there's going to be. 
I mean, there's not any pressure or any deception that's abounding like there's going to be. He says this will be the darkest time and the, the, the most dramatic time for evil and deception and lasting that the world has ever seen. He says there will never be anything before it. There will never be anything after it. It is the worst time ever. And yet today, even with the worldly pressure that we see now in the world, how many of you know that people's hearts grow cold and people fall away? Even now. So it shouldn't surprise us that as things get darker and things get more evil, that there are going to be those that fall away. Now, you got to understand, as I'm saying this, I'm saying it to myself because nobody's exempt. And I constantly read this and think about this. Because he says, it, he says even the very elect could be deceived. What this means, if we just laid it out plainly, is that sin will increase. So as a result of sinful things, we will see, we will see greater acts of perversion Greater, greater acts of lewdness, greater acts of, of homosexuality and homosexual, um, I guess, you know, acts in general, acts towards children and perversion towards children, uh, pedophilia, pornography, all, all sorts of perversions in that way will increase. And in the body of Christ, unfortunately, even now, there are people that, that dabble in those things. And they think that, well, it's okay. No, what's happening is you're being deceived and your heart's growing cold. That's what's happening. So sin will increase, which means crime will increase. Violent, violent crimes will increase. I mean, I'm not saying it. This, this is not even prophecy. I mean, just look around, the, look around the nation and you see it already. Every time you turn on the news, you turn on, there's, there's more, more. It's not getting better. It's getting worse. But it shouldn't surprise you because it's exactly what he says is going to happen. They're never going to come out with some kind of uh, way to keep peace in our cities and in our nation. There's never going to be. It doesn't matter how many law enforcement officers they get. It doesn't matter what kind of laws are written. It will not be able to stop this darkness that is coming to the nation and to the world. The reason you know that is because you can look at the Bible and see what it prophesies and what it foretells will come. We're not ever going to see that where total peace comes and, and it just gets better. It's going to get darker. But the Bible says that when the darkness gets dark, that the light gets lighter. And so what's going to happen is the true people of God are going to begin to really shine in this time. But it's not going to be the lukewarm people that we know in church today that are sitting there and could care less whether they change or don't change. There's going to be a group of people that fall away in the last days and it's going to be people that Jesus is really not their true Lord and their true Savior. They've really not given all of them, themselves to him. They're kind of one foot in the world, one foot in the church. And they're really not fully sold out to him. And I want to tell you again, I mean, this is not a message of condemnation. I'm not trying to preach fire, you know, hell and brimstone, get right or burn. You know, I'm not doing that. But at the same time, is this truth or not? And is it from the master's lips? about what will happen in the end times. Then they go on, he goes on, verse 23, if anyone says, look, here's the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the very elect. So, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, but basically we can look in Scripture and we can see very clearly how Jesus is coming back. Jesus is not coming back in secret Matter of fact, if you keep reading this chapter, he tells us exactly how he's coming back. The skies part. Glory to God. It says this, the, in Revelation, it says the sky is rolled back like a scroll. And it says the, the faces, the men of, of uh, the ungodly men are trying to hide their faces under the rocks because they cannot even look at the glory that's coming out of the, the heavens. It says there'll be a great trumpet blast. So we know that's how Jesus is returning. It will not be in secret. It will not be... You know, um, you won't hear about it on the news. You'll see it with your eyes. We will see it. It will be a, an event like the world has never seen. So you don't have to worry about if somebody's over here in this church or over there and they're doing all kinds of signs and wonders, but they're a false prophet and saying they're the Christ. Well, you know, that's just silly. But a lot of people are going to be deceived by it. Not us. Amen? So he says, I've told you beforehand. 
So if they say to you, look in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines from the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Now, verse 29, look down there. It says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give us light. So he's kind of given us a pretty clear progression here. You know, there's going to be wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes, those types of things. Then there's going to be this great tribulation that comes of darkness, deception, evil, crime, sin, abounding. There's going to be this great tribulation. Then he says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give us light. So we're going to begin to see some signs in the heavens, some tremendous signs that begin to take place in the atmosphere, the, uni the, the universe, things are going to begin to happen in that way. It says the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He will send out his angels with a loud trumpet and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. That's us. Amen. Skip down to verse 36. He said, but concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the son, but the father only, as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the son of man. For in those days before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the son of man. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken, one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the meal. One will be taken, one will be left. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect it. Amen. So he says it's going to be like the days of Noah. The last days are going to be similar to the days of Noah. Well, the darkness that abounded in the day of Noah was so great that it caused God to wipe the earth out. The darkness, the sin was so prevalent that it was the only act in all of the Bible that caused God to wipe out the entire human race, except for just a small group of people. He says it's going to be the same way in the last days. Many of you are probably sitting there thinking, man, I hope I die before all this starts happening. <laughs> hope I'm gone. <laughs> well, maybe. That's possible. I, I can't tell you, you know, it says nobody knows when it's going to happen. He does give us signs that we can see will begin to happen, and we can certainly see that some of them are already happening. I do know this. We're closer today than any other generation has ever been before. And I think it wise to prepare your heart because he says it's going to come when you least expect it. And that's part of the reason that I believe one of the strategies of the, of the, of the devil is to sort of rock Christians to sleep in their complacency and in their apathy because that's the, that's the thing that he says over and over is stay awake, stay alert. When he gives the parable of the ten virgins, what does he say? He says five of them were there, and they, they got sleepy, and they fell asleep. Uh, all of them fell asleep. But then the ones, they were not prepared. They were not prepared to endure to the end. You know, and when I look at that parable, the thing I notice about it, there's several things I notice about the parable of the ten virgins. Number one is that it calls them ten virgins. There were not five virgins and five prostitutes. They were called ten virgins. They all knew that the Lord was coming back. They were all waiting for his return. They all had oil in their lamps, which is a representation of the Holy Spirit. So you're not talking about five believers and five non-Christians. That is not the point of that parable. The point of the parable is to parallel exactly what he's saying here, that there's going to be a group that falls away. And so it's not that they didn't have oil, the five foolish virgins. It's not that they didn't have oil. It's that they did not have enough oil to endure to the end. And that's why he makes this powerful statement he says, he that endures to the end will be saved. Verse 13, Matthew 24, 13. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. 
It does no good to start the race and quit halfway through. It does no good to have some oil, but not enough to endure. So my point in telling you this this morning is I want us to be aware of the age that we live in. It's so easy to get caught up in the culture and the way that, that, um, the way that our culture is going and, and the things that it's participating in and the things that it says is important. But really, the Christian culture, more and more, more and more, for true believers, more and more, the Christian culture is not going to be able to mesh with worldly culture, and it's going to stand in stark contrast to it. How many of you think that Noah's life was in stark contrast to the sinner's lives in, whenever the flood came? I don't think he looked so much like the other sinners that he didn't sort of stand out as an oddball. For one thing, he's building this gigantic boat. <laughs> People are like, you idiot, what are you doing? That, you know, what, that doesn't even make any sense. You're building this boat. You've been working on it for 100 years, you know. But how many of you know that as soon as the first drop of rain fell and his family got in the boat, he didn't look so foolish anymore? I believe that before the Lord's return, that's going to happen more and more. That, first of all, he said we're going to be hated by all nations. And, and one of the reasons that we will be hated is because of our peculiarity. We're so, we're so different. We're going to be so different than the world. Our, our values, what we think is important. We're looked at as intolerant because we don't call sin good when they do. You know, they... They look at certain sins as homosexuality and different, oh, that's okay, you know, and that, and that, that's natural, they should be that way, and, and you're foolish if you don't accept that, or you're intolerant if you don't accept that. More and more, we're going to be looked at and called names and called things like that because our values are abrasive to theirs. So at some point, you have to decide how, how, how far am I willing to go with this worldly culture in my life? How, how much am I willing to participate in before I draw the line and say, I'm not participating in this anymore? And I think the, the answer there is that when the Holy Spirit leads you and prompts you or convicts you about something, be willing to make the change. If you're convicted about certain movies that you're watching, then, then cut it out. Get rid of it. If you're convicted about certain people you're hanging around, get rid of it. Be, be will, be, have the courage to make the change. Recently, I was watching, my wife and I were watching a, a documentary on the Amish. Don't y'all get nervous. We're not, we're not going to be like the Amish community. <laughs> but we were watching a documentary on the Amish, and, and they, you know, these people, wow, do their life ever contrast the world? My goodness, it just starkly contrasts the, the life of the world. And it's really interesting listening to some of the fathers talk about why they made the choices to, uh, to live, you know, without technology and different things. And I like one of the things that the guy said. He said, you know, uh, what's ha what, what happens is the technology comes in and it directs the way that you start living. And he said, we were, we were, you know, the Amish people were tired of the technology coming in and shaping our children, shaking our family time, shaping everything about it. We wanted to be in control of shaping our values. We wanted to be in control of shaping our, our children's values. And really, what I noticed as I was watching that, and I said this to my wife, we were watching that, and I said, you know, what's, what's really sad about this is that a lot of what they're saying, most Christians actually believe deep down in here, but do not have the courage to live it out. You know, the things that they were saying about the world, the things they were saying about the technology shaping their kids, the things they were saying about all of that, I was thinking, you know, many Christians, for the most part, we actually believe the same way that they believe on this, but we do not have the courage to take the stand that they take. Now, I'm not telling you to be Amish. Don't, don't misunderstand me there. They're, they're, they're out of balance, and that's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is, is that if the Lord convicts you about taking a drastic measure in your life for change, should you be willing to take it? Should you be willing to make change in your life that contrasts the world and that even people in your family may not understand it, loved ones who are close to you may not understand it? Yes, you have, to, you have to be willing to do that. And what I want to get in your spirit this morning is that the ones he's talking about here that fall away are the ones at some point who will refuse to change. 
See, the world's going to keep changing their way, and the Christian world's going to keep changing our way. And at some point, the, the, what he's talking about, the ones who are going to fall away, are the ones who refuse to change as the Spirit leads them. Because how many of you believe that if we were going into dark times, if we were moving into this, this time period, how many of you believe that God would lead his people? He would begin to prepare his people. He's not going to let us just go into this blindsided. For one thing, he gave us the word. But how many of you know that from the pulpit and, and, and from the preachers, there would begin to be a certain type of message, a certain type of word that would prepare our hearts and prepare our spirits and prepare our minds so that we're not caught blindsided by this. And all I know is at the beginning of the year, I began to seek God and ask him, Father, what is the word for this year? What do you want me to focus on? And the thing that kept coming to my spirit is change, 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 change. I am wanting to change the body of Christ. I'm wanting to see my people change. I'm wanting to see them change for the better. I think if we were honest with ourselves, we could look around and see that many in the body of Christ are lukewarm. Their hearts are not on fire for the Lord. Their, their hearts are lukewarm. And I'm just telling you, the bottom line of everything that I've said today is that in those last days, the lukewarm will not make it. The lukewarm will fall away. And so we have got to decide now. You don't decide when all this starts happening. You don't decide, okay, I'm going to get things right with God. I'm going to change now. Well, it's, it's really too late then. The change has to begin now. The preparation has to begin now because you don't become mature in the Lord where you need to be to withstand this kind of deception overnight. It's a process of being shaped and formed into his image. It's a process of responding to the, the unctions of the Holy Spirit to make the changes in your life. I can guarantee you that many of those that are sitting out here, you hear the voice of God speaking to you and your family more than you know. I really believe it. I believe that each of you as you're sitting in here, I believe that there are changes that the Lord has spoken to you about or convicted you about at different times. But we have to have the courage to actually do the things that he tells us to do. And I want to encourage you as, as you know, the men as being the head of your home and being the leader of, of your family spiritually, I believe that God is going to speak to you as the head of your home. Of course, he's going to speak to the wives. I believe he's going to speak to the kids. I believe it will be a family event. But the men in particular, as the leaders of your home, I believe that God is going to speak to you about changes that need to take place in your home. It may not be popular with everybody in the family. <laughs> I know we've made some decisions in our fast that were not popular with my three-year-old and my two-year-old. <laughs> but down the road, they're going to be thankful for it. They're going to be thankful that I had the courage to lead my home and to lead my family. And I firmly believe that those of you, those, those men who are part of this church, I believe that even now that God is speaking to your hearts about some things that need to be done differently for your family. And I want to encourage you, take it to prayer, pray over it, seek God about it, get counsel about it, but have the courage to make the changes necessary that are going to push your family towards God and run into his arms so that in these last days, your family will not be one that falls away, but your family will be one that's bright. Your family will be one that's burning bright in these last days. You think we've seen something in the book of Acts, you know, when God birthed the church, even though it was accompanied by all sorts of persecution and all sorts of imprisonment and things like that. But, you know, that was the beginning of the church, and it came in with such a bang, but God's not going to send us out like a dud. When this thing ends, the church is going out with a bang, too. And it's going to be those. He's going to use those. You're going to see more signs and wonders. You're going to see more miracles than the church has ever seen before, and it's not going to be something that we have to work up. It's not going to be something that's fake. It's going to be something that God did just like he did in the book of Acts. And if you don't believe it, just go read through the book of Revelation and see all of the tremendous signs and wonders that are happening over and over and over. One of the miraculous signs that's going to happen in those last days is just going to be the fact that the people of God are preserved. That's one of the biggest miracles, just like whenever, just like whenever the death angel came through Egypt and the, and the children of Israel, they had the, the blood put on their doorpost and, and, all, and the, the death angel came through and took the firstborn of all the Egyptians, but none of the firstborn of the Israelites were taken. They were all spared. You think that might have been a miracle to the, to the Egyptians, might have been a testimony to them? 
Same thing happens in the book of Revelation. 